Hey! Welcome to another video that is basically Jason rambles about stuff. We are constantly being bombarded with memes and news, all sorts of stuff, you know, just from our digital lives. And what happens all the time, of course, is that I would have responses, I would have thoughts and things to say. So rather than always having them just play back inside of my brain, I figured that once in a while I'd actually try to make a video and, you know, talk about it physically. So the thing that I want to react to as it were today is this picture that was posted onto the website 9gag and uh, it's an image depicting Jesus Christ you know talking to a child and telling him that uh, the man who murdered this child and his family is there in paradise with him saying hey go and say hi he's here because he repented and asked for forgiveness now, of course, um, like many of this sort of images, it is meant as a kind of jeer or ridicule of the Christian position. And I suppose the implication here is that it's kind of unjust or absurd that a very gravely sinful person, like a mass murderer, could end up in paradise together with the people that he murdered for the apparently cheap price of repentance. This is not exact, not necessarily an unfair representation of the Christian position. This is actually pretty much what Christians believe. And uh, it's also kind of encouraging to see that some people in the comment section, which is a place that against my better judgment I sometimes wander into, some people in the comment section do seem to get the point. They would point out that, yes, this is actually, you know, that's how forgiveness works. Yeah, this is God we're talking about. So he would actually be able to tell between people who are feigning repentance and remorse and people who have genuine repentance and remorse. Now, of course, there are also others in the comment section who are raising objections to this uh, idea of forgiveness. And I think broadly, their objections can be summarized as in two points. One is that this may allow a kind of gaming of the system where you could make use of the possibility of forgiveness as a kind of get out of jail card to go and, you know, sin however you want. And two is complaints that it is unjust after all, where they think that, you know, the victims of the sinner is somehow put on a kind of a lower standing because their transgressors are apparently let off so easily. And that, you know, their wish for retribution for their transgressors may not be respected and you think that that's not fair, that's not just. So, in response to the first point about gaming the system, I would say that that's not really quite right. That's, that's, uh, that's not a valid observation because it is impossible to plan genuine remorse or repentance beforehand. And this is something that you can construct, I think, a fairly rigorous argument against. And Roughly, you would say that if you already have what it takes to plan ahead that you should genuinely regret something that you're going to do, that means you already know that you should not do that thing. And you already have all the motivation that you need in order to prevent yourself to do the thing in the first place. So you can't plan to think that what you're going to do is a completely bad idea sincerely. And so you can't plan to to be repentant beforehand because if you did then you wouldn't do the thing that you needed to repent for in the first place. So it does not work as a get out of jail card on that perspective. Now as for the people who are complaining about the injustice of the arrangement, people may generally defer on this I suppose. It's something that may not be as clear cut. But for my part I think that this uh, the Christian view is right and I think that it is one of the deep ways in fact in which Christianity gets ethics right. Let me try to explain myself. 
First of all, it is certainly the Christian view that people get forgiven in this way. One might, you know, recall the famous parable of the prodigal son, where the transgressing son is eventually received unconditionally and with open arms the second that he repented. Whereas the son that remained faithfully uh, behind with his father was rebuked for complaining about the huge reception for his wayward brother. Now to see why I think that this view of ethics is right, I think it's instructive to look at the situation in kind of from another angle, right? So here's the thing, either all sins, no matter the severity, may be forgiven given genuine remorse and repentance, or it must be possible for a person to exist who, no matter what he does from here, no matter what he learns, no matter what he feels, no matter what he attempts to do, no matter what kind of evolution or learning or change in attitude that he, you know, he executes, that he goes through, he must be condemned without mercy. That is, you know, the necessary implication of the existence of some sin for which forgiveness may not, complete forgiveness may not be given. If there are sins or combinations of sins where complete forgiveness cannot be given, that means whoever who gets there has earned for himself irredeemable condemnation. Right. And note here that we're talking about cosmic justice, right? We're not necessarily talking about how a human court of law should behave because terrestrial justice systems also have social objectives and they deal with people who are mortal and who don't live for very long, right? So uh, we're not talking about what a court of law should do, we're talking about what is right objectively, cosmically, what is right with a capital R. And to that, I'd say that I don't personally believe that there's a point after which you have an irredeemable condemnation. I don't believe that a person can so damn himself that he can never be right again in a cosmic, you know, objective sense, that he can never be right again before God. And this is a big part of what I find appealing about the way Christianity thinks about ethics, right? Intrinsic to this philosophy is the idea of hope. It means that there is always hope, no matter where you are, no matter how dreary your situation, no matter what you've done, no matter what terrible state you've dragged yourself into, no matter what irredeemable transgressions you may have committed, if you turn back now, at the point where you turn back, you will, you will find hope. And that is something that resonates very strongly with me, which is why I really agree with this whole idea of cosmic forgiveness. Now, side by side with this, notably as well, is that this only works alongside forgiveness of our enemies as well. Because if a sinner, a grave sinner, can with true repentance become right with God, then his victims, those that he transgressed against, can also be right with God only if they have forgiven him. Because otherwise they would view him with resentment. Right, much in the way many of the commenters talk about. Right? So how can you be right with God alongside another person if, if you also resent the person, his, his redemption? Right? So a foundational component of Christian ethics is, is this combination, that the transgressor must repent in dust and ashes. And also, those who are transgressed against must learn to forgive, just as God forgives. Finally, as a kind of footnote to all of these considerations, I'd like to point out that if we are loath to think a serial murderer might eventually be granted heaven, then it would be quite inconsistent to also adopt that popular refrain that if God can forgive us all, why doesn't he just forgive us? Why the atonement of Christ? Why the threat of death and hell? If we as imperfect humans find ourselves clamoring for blood at the sight of crime, how much more seriously will it be taken by justice itself? Hope that was somewhat interesting. I'll probably try to do a bit more of these rambles every now and then. After all, there's plenty of things to react to online. So have a good one. Enjoy your chrysanthemum teas and uh, I'll see you in the next video.